Hello, and welcome to another PNP Live. Um, my name is Bashan. and I'm part of the event staff with Politics and Pros. Uh, this event is brought to you in partnership with the Royal Norwegian Embassy. Um, before we do begin, just a few items I'd like to go over. Uh, the first being that at any time during this event, you can go to the chat section where you will find a link where you can go directly to the Policy and Pros website where you can purchase a copy of The Kingdom and The Law of Innocence by our two authors. Of course, we highly encourage and thank all of you for your patronage um, at this time. The other thing is that separate from the chat section, we would ask that if any of you would like to try to ask a question of any of the authors, you would place it in the separate Q&A box, um, which again is separate from chat, and that just will help us to try to facilitate the question and answer period. Uh, now, I have the pleasure of introducing two dynamic authors um, in no particular order. First, we have Joe Nesbo. Joe is a musician, songwriter, economist, and author. He has won the Glass Key Award for the best Nordic crime novel. His Harry Hole novels include The Redeemer, The Snowman, The Leopard, Phantom, and most recently, Knife. And he is also the author of Headhunters, Macbeth, and several children's books. Uh, in addition to Joe, today we, uh, we have Mr. Michael Connolly with us also. Michael is the author of 31 novels, including multiple number one New York Times bestsellers. His books, which include the Harry Bosch series and Lincoln Lawyer series, have sold more than 74 million copies worldwide. Mr. Connolly is a former newspaper reporter who has won numerous awards for his journalism and his novels and is the executive producer of Bosch, starring Titus Welliver. They are joined today by Aline Cogdo. Uh, Aline reviews mystery fiction for the Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale, Tribune Publishing Wire, publishes weekly, Shelf Awareness, Associated Press, and Mystery Scene Magazine. Her mystery fiction reviews appear in more than 300 publications worldwide, she also blogs regularly at mysteryscreenmag.com. She has received the 2013 Raven Award from the Mystery Writers of America, the 1997 Sun Sentinel's Pettyjohn Award, and the 1999 Eleanor Award by the American Crime Writers League. Aline is a judge for the 2020 and 2021 Los Angeles Times Book Prize in the mystery thriller category. Without any further ado, Aline, it's all yours. Hello, everybody. I am delighted to be a part of this discussion today. And I also want to thank Politics and Prose and the Royal Norwegian Embassy for setting this up. Before we begin, I just want to make a plug for bookstores, such as Politics and Prose. Bookstores are a lifeline for us. They bring us knowledge, entertainment, and they are a real force in the community. And if you can, please buy a book from your local independent bookstores such as Politics and Prose. Um, and I wanna thank all the readers for coming today. And as I said, I will start filling your questions about quarter till about 45 minutes into our discussion. Please put down in the Q&A part your question and I will do my best to get to everyone. Um, so let's get started. Michael and Joe, um, both of you are well known for your series characters. And both of you take a bit of a break from those series characters in your latest books. Two part question for both of you. Michael, this is the second novel this year in which Harry Bosch is not the lead character. What inspired you to take a break from Harry and return to Mickey Haller in The Law of Innocence? And does writing about another character impact your regular series, Michael? Um, I wasn't like, I have to take a break from Harry Bosch. It was more like, you know, a, an interest in the story, you know, kind of gripped my imagination and you, you know, you write by instinct or by the seat of your pants, you go with what you feel that you want to do. Um, and so uh, I'm actually inclined not to leave Harry Bosch behind because he ages in real time. And it, I think there's a finite amount of time when I can write about him. But sometimes stories just push through and um, they're just for other characters. Um, I wrote a story about a journalist earlier this year that was mm -hmm. very much inspired by, you know, what's going on in the world in terms of trust and media, fake news, all that kind of stuff. It was just the right time to write that story. 
and I and and I've been missing Mickey Haller's voice. He's been in a few of the Harry Bosch novels, but I've missed his voice, and I just felt it's time to write in his voice, and so it just ha turned out this way. But I'll get back to Bosch pretty soon. Good, uh, Joe. Same question. Um, what inspired you to take a break from your Harry Hole? novels and does writing about another character that you have to basically make up from whole cloth how does that impact your regular series mm -hmm. well uh, my, my my answer is is more or less the same as as, as michael's that uh, you know the 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 idea for the story is uh, is the boss um and it's um uh, um, I had uh, this idea that at some point in time I will write about brothers, um, having uh, grown up in a family with uh, two brothers myself, and um, um, my my younger brother who passed away uh, six years ago. Um, we were very close, so um, um, it's it, it's not like uh, the kingdom is a keyhole into. Uh, the life of me and my younger brother, but it is uh, definitely inspired by those emotions, those close bonds that you have with the brother. Actually, that leads to my next question: is in reading both of your review, both of your novels, which I both of which I have reviewed, it seems like there's an underlying theme of family in both, Joe, especially in yours, in the kingdom, in which you know that close dark bond between the brothers is very complicated. And you said it was inspired a little bit by the close relationship you had with your own late brother. Can you expand on that a little bit, please? Um, well, uh, just like um, Roy and uh, and Carl, the two brothers in the kingdom, who um, they live in a small um, town in the, in the mountains in the, in Norway. They um, share a room. They uh, sleep in the same bunk bed, uh, and. Um, uh, they go to parties together. They fall in love with the same girls, and it was like that with me and my uh, my brother too. We we shared a room. Um, we played on the same soccer teams. We would fight and quarrel, uh, but still love each, each other and be there for each other uh, when when there were when there was trouble on the horizon. And um, later on, we would play in the same band, a uh, band in which he played until he passed away from cancer. Um, so it was a uh, um, it was the kind of story that, that, that I knew I would write at some point in time. Maybe it was easier to write it actually after he passed away uh, mm. because of more, more, more freedom. Um, just like um, in the past, I've been writing about relationship, the son-father relationship, which was also probably easier because my, my father passed away. Michael, uh, sort of the same question. There's a real sense of family relationship in the law of innocence. And that really goes beyond the fact that Mickey Haller and Harry Bosch are half brothers. His, Mickey's dependence on his legal team or trying to work on his defense while he's in jail. There's a real sense of family there. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure, I mean, it was, <clears throat> it seems like the obvious choice to make um, I don't, you know, Harry Bosch, for example, grew up alone and uh, Mickey Haller pretty much grew up alone. He has w older siblings. He was a second generation for his father, basically. So, so <clears throat> there isn't a whole lot of family um, stuff to explore in their backgrounds. But, I, but in this book, you know, Mickey Haller is facing the, uh, the challenge of his life. And it just st stood to reason that, fa that family would come in to to kind of brace you and to guard you and to help you. And, you know, that's probably from my own experience. I have, I have actually have two brothers too, and we're very close. I'm close to my sisters. And I've just never explored that family dynamic that I had in my books, because I end up writing about guys who are loners for the most part. Uh, but this was an opportunity to like draw ranks and, and bring the family in. So, you know, it's courtroom drama for the most part, but when he's there, he's got um, the people who love him are there to support him. And, and that actually was kind of a new experience for me in writing about that. Well, character is king, I think, in both of your novels. And Michael, while you're still on the screen, um, I love how you weave in um, the other characters from your other books and you do it in such a way that's organically. Why do you do that? 
I think, well, the quick answer is it's fun to do, but I also write the way I read. And I love, I love that kind of stuff in the books I read. And in a way, it's a little reward if you're sticking with a writer over several books to, to have the aha moment where a character shows up from a prior book or, or there's cross-referencing of characters. Um, that, that's a great thing to come across as a reader. Um, and I'm obviously aware of that. So um, I put it in my own books and it's, it's actually also fun to do when you try to figure out how, as you say, organically they can cross. You don't want to like totally uh, force these type of things to happen. It's got to kind of work. I also remember on one of your books, you had a reference to um, Elvis Cole, uh, kind of an un unnamed cameo. And readers really picked up on that. And then of course he returned the favor with an unnamed ca uh, cameo of Harry Bosch in one of his books. But again, it was so organic to the story. Um, it worked really yeah, well, Bob, I thought. Well, yes. Bob Pace and I, you know, um, know each other uh, out here in LA and uh, we schemed that up once when we were having lunch. And it was, <laughs> don't, don't use the other guy's name, just see if people figured this out. Cause we're obviously aware that we have crossover readers and so forth. So that was kind of fun to do. I, I mentioned I mentioned in my, my review, and I've blogged about it a couple of times. And readers are always want to know which which book it is. So we'll just make it a little bit of a mystery today. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, um, have you ever thought about adding Harry, your Harry, into any of your standalone books? Um, no, I uh, I haven't really. I um, I tend to um, uh, to make up different uh, universes for uh, for for my stories um so um uh for me it it would probably be a distraction i think uh um i like to like in 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 the kingdom there is no harry hall <laughs> it no, not, there is. <laughs> it doesn't exist the, I, actually there the, the, there may be a harry hall novel on the shelf <laughs> 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 but he, he he doesn't exist in uh, in real life. But I was going going to ask uh, Michael because it's interesting. I mean, um, um, in in the Mickey Haller novels, you write in um, first person narrative, and in the Harry Bosch, it's a third person narrative. But it must be interesting to have Mickey Haller in the in in the Bosch novels, then suddenly being uh, a, a person with a uh, with a third person narrative or perspective. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I ended up writing this book because um, it's, been, uh, it's been seven years since we've had a first person story from uh, Mickey Haller. And I think he has a distinctive voice and, um, and it's kind of wry and sardonic and, and I love that voice. And that's what was missing. Like he, he's been dropped into at least two um, uh, Bosch books, I get, or I mean, it gets all mixed up. Maybe they're actually Renee Ballard books. I don't really know how to classify them, but he <laughs> is, as you say, in third person. So it's a view of him from some from another angle, and and I really like the you know in his head first person kind of whispering to you how the system works or doesn't work, and I that's what I missed, and uh, that's what draw me drew me back to uh, doing this book. I I find that I must say. Uh... I find that um, um, humor is 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 more easy to use when you when you write it in the first uh, person uh, when you have a first person uh, narrator like in, in in the kingdom and also in in headhunters and I, uh, mm -hmm. I sometimes miss that inner monologue that you can um, that you can use uh, and and express thoughts and 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 a dry sense of humor the way you do in uh, this book and um, that. Um, um, that you 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 have to rely more on dialogue when you write in the third person narrative. Yeah, I mean humor and like vulnerabilities. I, I think. Oh yeah. The first person just jump starts the connection to character because it's you're la you're laid bare. You can't cheat the reader by leaving stuff out. <clears throat> you know, it's it's the person um, their voice talking right to the reader, and uh, there is something very. Uh, really good about that. I tried Bosch a couple times in first person. Um, and uh, I, then I went back to third because I was too set in my ways with, uh, with Bosch in third person and keeping stuff from the reader till I want them to know it. And Harry's too, too set in his own ways also. <laughs> 
Um, setting is very important, I think, to both of your books. Michael, you always have yours pretty much in Los Angeles, though you've taken a couple of trips sideways to Florida. Law of Innocence, Mickey is in the jail most of the time. And Joe, in Law in the in the kingdom, you have this wide open space in Norway, this huge piece of land. Yet with both, I felt there was a real claustrophobic feel because there was no escape from Harry. I'm mean, sorry, from Mickey, unless he posted a $5 million bond. And Joe, there was really no escape for the brothers either. And Joe, let's, let's talk about this rural setting. I also grew up in a very small town in Missouri, not Norway, but Missouri. But I don't remember my neighbors being as nasty as your villagers were. <laughs> talk about setting a little bit, please. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm probably 70% a city boy myself, but my, both my parents grew up in small um, towns like in the kingdom uh, in Norway. And um, my, so my, uh, when I visited my grandparents for summer holidays and Christmas holidays, I mostly met nice people, I have to admit. So, uh, um, so it's uh, not me meant as an insult to, to town people, but uh, in this particular town, there are a number of mean people to put it that way but uh, um i i i like the setting it it was interesting the setting i mean the difference between living in the city and, and and a town like this is that um in a town you are um you don't meet anybody without them knowing uh most of your background they know you e even if you haven't met them before they will know who your parents are and grandparents <laughs> Your, your sins and deeds and uh, um, so um, it's like you have this background story that you can never escape and and probably uh, they won't let you um, take on a new role take on a new character which is the opportunity you have in the big city of course you can sort of reinvent yourself uh, in the, when, when you have new settings and meet new people um, so and I think for in the small town, this is, it's both sort of a, to some degree, comfort and safety. Uh, you know that people, uh, even if they don't like you, they will feel obliged to take care of you if something bad happens. Um, um, but on the other hand, you have, of course, like you said, the uh, claustrophobic feeling of never being really able to escape the person that they have decided you are. And Michael, in your case, I think you have covered just about every part of Los Angeles in your novels, but never the jail. And tell us about this claustrophobic, this, this had to be a big departure for you and use and the use of setting. Sure, I mean, I just, I, you know, it's about putting challenges in front of your, uh, characters and again I go back to that it's been seven years since I had Mickey Haller carry a book and one reason for that delay was that when you, I think the legal drama is more um, constricted than say any kind of other oh, yeah. mystery genre because it's basically you're heading towards a box a courtroom and, and things have to happen there and you know and there's only so many permutations of it and so i had written i think five books with mickey haller and they were more or less the same permutation um with with some degree of difference and so i was running out of like what do i do next and and so it finally came to me that if i charged if mickey got charged with the crime and he was in jail that would be a whole new setup for for you know showing off this character and so, um, you know, I wanted, I, you know, he's, you know, this is not a big spoiler. It happens in the first chapter. He's arrested for a murder. He can't make bonds, so he's in jail. So probably at least half of this book, he's in a jail, trying, a jail cell, trying to strategize how to defend himself. And so the challenges to him on a legal basis, the challenges to me as a writer, you know, how do I get momentum? How do I get people turning pages when this guy is very sedentary? and stuck in a jail. And obviously I can do that through the people helping him and so forth. And then when he is put on a bus and the bus is a place of danger when you're being moved from a jail to a courthouse. Um, so there, there's ways of keeping intensity going until you get to that courtroom and, 
and you kind of unleash him in terms of his arguments and interactions with opponents, family, um, uh, staff, all that kind of stuff. There was always a real threat to Mickey throughout the book, you know, when he's in the jail, of course, and anything can happen on the bus and even walking to the courtroom, there was just all this tension that, that really built up. And um, again, I loved The Law of Innocence and The Kingdom, both really strong novels for this year. Um, I know that both of you kind of do research for your books. And uh, Joe, I understand that you came up with the idea of Harry Hall on a flight to Australia. And then you had to figure out how the cops work in Norway. And I was told, I don't know if this is true or not, maybe fake news, that you were commissioned by a publisher to write a memoir of being on the road with your band. But instead, you came up for a plot with Harry Hull. So let's talk a little bit of the research. And, and did I get that right? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's, uh, that's right. I, uh, I was, uh, was asked by girl I know who worked at the, uh, at the publishing house to write about the band on the road. But I told her that, you know, uh, the rule is that what happens on the road stays on the road. So I, I won't <laughs> write about the band, but I can, can uh, write uh, uh, maybe something else. So I had five weeks um, in Australia where I was for the first couple of weeks, I was traveling with a friend and uh, the rest of the time I was on my own. And uh, I started, I, I had probably, I was 37 at the time and I had probably been nurturing the idea of writing a novel at some point. Um, and um, so I had to come up with something like a novel that I could write in five weeks. That was sort of the challenge. Mm. That was the time I had before I had to get back and, and go back to work. Um, so I, I figured that, okay, a, a crime novel, uh, sort of a simple who's done it novel. Um, I, ca I can do that in five weeks. And so that was <laughs> like, it wasn't, I had no idea it was going to get published. It was just for me, it was like a, uh, like a, uh, you know, to get the attention of the publishing house. So I was a bit shocked when they said that, okay, um, we want to publish this. Um, actually, my first reaction was, can I have it back and rewrite it for, for a year or something? Um, but uh, that, that was the start of the Harry Hall series. Yeah, you're right. Um, you, you, you asked about research. Um, I... Um, uh, I get, and I, uh, I, I suspect it's the same for Michael. That research is is one of the my favorite aspects of uh, of writing a book. You know, I just I just love doing the uh, the research. It's uh, it's it's probably one of the reasons why I write books. I'm I'm I'm, I'm curious about stuff. I want to find out stuff. It's um, uh, I I just enjoy that. So um, of course. Uh, there's always a danger that you, if you invest too much time in doing research, you feel uh, uh, th that you have to put it in, that you invested so much time in the uh, research that you have to put it into the uh, book. But I think mm -hmm. of the time, hopefully I've, I've learned that, uh, you know, you, you're probably just going to use bits and pieces of the research because if you know what you're writing about, it will it will show on paper it mm -hmm. um, the, the authenticity um, uh, if it if if it's not forced it, it it will ring true i think was your band i take it your band was a rock band would, would did you ever play in america no never we we were sort of a power pop band um okay. And uh, well, actually, we're still uh, we're still playing, but we uh, our lyrics are in Norwegian, so I don't think uh, anyone outside outside Norway uh, I've ever heard about us. Okay, and were the Norwegian cops were the they receptive when you approached them? Oh, well, very, very. Okay. Um, I, I I remember actually um, a, a, a few years after I had my first. It was just after my first novel. I was on my way to an interview with a newspaper and I was, um, I was arrested by the police because uh, by coincidence, there had been a bank robbery close to, to, to where I was walking. <laughs> on, and, 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 and I fit the description of, uh, of the robber. So they actually stopped me and you know uh, I had to lean up against the wall and they were searching me. 
And then he found my wallet. He looked at the wallet and he saw the name and said that, oh, I really enjoyed your last novel. <laughs> okay. well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and after that, that, that they named the new room, I think, at the police, um, police house in Oslo. So uh, I, I, I think, although um, he's not um, the ideal police officer, uh, I mean, he's a heavy drinker and he's troublemaker at the police house, they, they, they seem to like him. Yeah. Michael, you always have um, a lot of subplots in your book. And The Law of Innocence um, has a, a real doozy. And I understand this was kind of based, the scams were kind of based on a case in Utah. Do I have that right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was just thinking about um, maybe I should have done what Yo did and get arrested and then be put in jail so I could firsthand research the jail aspects of this uh, <laughs> of my book, which I had to basically do by talking to people that um, work in jails, but um, um, that would have been more interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean- We would have, I, we would know, have made bail for you, Michael. <laughs> yeah, one, one thing I totally agree with, with Yo about, you know, um, the research. It, it's the fun part, but it's also, also the stuff you gotta use very sparingly and, um, you know, I just, I'm always like throwing out a net and looking for interesting things. And so it was a number of years ago, I read about uh, in the New York Times about the scam that occurred in Utah where the government, which was trying to prop up um, or encourage the manufacture of what they call clean oil uh, made from organics and so forth. And they were giving refunds to oil refineries and so forth that did it. And it led to this massive, massive ripoff of of millions and millions of dollars and and the scam itself was was so cool and it was basically about driving an oil tanker out of the refinery full of this oil and then driving the same thing back and just doing it over and over and clicking the government um pay scale basically and uh so in this first chapter again no spoiler uh, mickey's arrested for they find that um someone murdered in the trunk of his lincoln and it turns out it's one of his former clients who's a con man, who was a con man. And uh, so Mickey obviously in building his defense knows he was involved in a con and, and that leads to an exposure of this uh, oil, organic oil scam that is um, actually worked realistically a few years ago in Utah. And Michael, you've had a good relationship too with the LA police, right? And when you do research, didn't they even want to pass something to keep Harry on the force after his retirement? Um, well, what, what happened was he, I, <clears throat> I think I made a mistake in, in I retired, I, Harry's retired from the force twice. Yeah. The first time I had him retire, um, I wrote a book where he was kind of basically a private eye on his own, just, just following up on cases he never solved. And I realized I had unintentionally ended the series because that would be too repetitive. And I was trying to figure out what do I do if Harry would say, save him. And then in the meantime, I heard about a detective I knew when I was a reporter who had retired and had been allowed to come back to work cold cases. And, uh, you know, I, I was under the impression that once you leave the LAPD, they don't let you back in. And so I did some, I made some calls and so forth. And out of the blue, I got a call from the police chief saying, I hear Harry wants to come back. You know, uh, what can I do to get him back? <laughs> As if he's a real person. And then he ended up faxing me um, the application to return as a detective, same rank and all this stuff. And so when Harry goes back into the police department, he actually follows a realistic path to getting back and not losing his stripes, so to speak, and being able to be a detective in uh, at the same kind of level he was when he left. Joe, you've also written about scams too. I think in your book, Occupied, am I correct in that? Yeah, well, um, Occupied is a, is a, is a TV series. Um, um, the basic idea is, is, is also uh, well based on, uh, on the oil industry, uh, but it's um, Norway being a, a big, um, um, oil producer and the exporter of oil as um, has in this sort of science fiction um, story uh, decided that they will stop producing oil, uh, which leads to Norway being um, 
in, invaded and occupied by by Russia, but it's sort of a sort of in in agreement with the EU and the United States. So Norway, being a small country, is of course then helpless um, uh, in this situation. And what the story deals with is a uh, is is um, you know it's it's the idea of how would because this is a very soft occupation it's a silk op occupation people seemingly uh, keep all their privileges their uh, standard of living they can go to london for their weekend shopping uh, it seems like you have the same news uh, so uh, the question is of course if you are occupied like that but you get to keep your life what are you willing to um, sacrifice for words like freedom and independence and democracy um, um so that is uh, actually it's 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 not a book it's just that um the this was the idea that was the basis for the tv series okay occupy and that leads me to my next question is both of you have had your books become on the screen um bosch which is uh wrapping up its its final season right now filming it uh, it's one of my favorite TV series. And Joe, your books have been um, in several movies, The Snowman, Headhunters, TV series. And I think there's something about the sun that's in the works. How do you both feel about seeing your work on the screen and are there future projects? And Joe, go ahead and you're already on, so. Well, um, well, right now it's um, uh, there's, I, I've written a short story uh, called London. Um, which uh, Ben Stiller is attached to uh, uh, direct uh, and turn into a um, movie, I, uh, I believe. The, it's early days of that yet. Uh, the director, uh, Denis Villeneuve and Jake Gyllenhaal uh, are working on uh, my standalone novel, um, The Sun, uh, together with Jonathan Nolan. Um, it's, uh, they plan to, for it to be a... Um, miniseries on HBO um, and uh, like always uh, I guess same thing with uh, with Michael again that there are so many projects uh, in the pipeline but uh, realistically you know that uh, you know if 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 one in 20 ends up on the screen you're, you're lucky yeah. yeah and Michael I mean I love Bosch I I'm sad to see it end but it's ending on such a high note um, what are your thoughts about seeing your work become on the screen? You've had several movies based, and what are the future projects? Well, I mean, it's fun when you when you can be involved. I've been pretty highly involved in Bosch, and so uh, I, I feel like, I mean, I'm very happy with that show, very proud of it, and I, I feel like I can take some credit for it because because uh, I am involved in it, you know, and the, and the film side usually the write, writers of the book writers get um, kind of pushed aside as very much a director's, director's medium where TV isn't. So my interest is more lately has been in, in TV because then I have to say on how things are, are going. Um, I was three days away from, we had filmed one day basically on a TV show um, based on Lincoln Lawyer series and uh then covid came it got shut down and then cbs which was the network that had it just didn't about face and killed the whole project which which gave it back to me and so i um you know i'm right now i can't say anything but i i would say before the end of the year i'll be able to announce a new home and uh, i think there'll be a lincoln lawyer tv show next year did you have anything to do with the casting because i think titus is just the the perfect boss and I love the woman who plays his daughter. Yeah, I mean, I like the whole cast. <laughs> the, the casting on the show is, I think, the key to a success. Mm -hmm. Everyone, who, whatever their part is, they're perfect for it. I did have a say, and I was the one who suggested Titus in the first place. I, I always toot my horn about that because I, I'm not a TV guy, didn't really have experience with it. And when we went into the first uh, discussions of casting, I threw his name in it simply because I saw him as a guest star in the show where he would play the guy with PTSD. And I just thought he, he, he basically can project inner damage and inner uh, uh, concerns and so forth. And so I threw his name into it and um, 
they they said he was not available because he was in China making a movie and uh, wouldn't be able. We had like six weeks to find our Bosch and, and he wasn't due to come back. But um, we ended up right at the end of the six week period. We hadn't found our Bosch and we were thinking of pushing back on the whole schedule. So we found the right guy because that was the the decision we had to make. Uh, we found out he was coming back for a weekend to visit his family. And so we got him all jet lagged from flying in from Hong Kong to, uh, <laughs> to read, read uh, a couple scenes uh, in an audition on a Saturday. And, and he, he won the part right there in the room. He got it right away. I also love the actor who plays Edgar, who of course was on the wire. I mean, it's just a first class ca cast, I think. Yeah, Jimmy um, had it great. Oh yeah. Um, both of you have had your works translated into other languages. Um, Joe, you especially, because you write in Norwegian, how is the translation for you when you see your book in English? Because I know you can read English. Hmm. Um, well, it's, um, well, it's, um, I mean, things, um, things will get lost in um, translation. Uh, that is uh, inevitable. It's, uh, um, and uh, so um, I did read the first couple of chapters of my first novel uh, in English and um, I realized that uh, my translator at that time, Don Bartlett, was uh, doing a good job uh, but I did see that things did get lost but uh, I also realized I couldn't have done a better job myself trying to translate so mm. uh, so um, uh, at the end of the day, you just have to tr trust your tra translator. And I, I actually, I, I spare myself the frustration of seeing what what was lost in translation. So so by now, I, I don't really read my books in, in in English. My my agent do that for me because when you write in a small language like Norwegian, mm -hmm. um, you have to rely on your English translation when you are getting translated to, I mean, Korean and, uh, and languages where it's um, difficult to find a, uh, a good Norwegian Korean translator or, or whatever. Um, so um, the English translation is, uh, is, um, is of course, um, really important. Um, but um, you can, I mean, uh, uh, this, Besides the English translation, I, I know little German. I can read the Danish and Swedish um, uh, translations, uh, but but I have to admit, I, I I don't really do that. I don't have time for that. I concentrate on my next novel and, and hope they're doing a good job. Michael, um, same for you, the translation part. Oh, by the way, Michael, before you answer that, we're getting a lot of people saying they want to see Timothy Oliphant as Mickey Haller. <laughs> So there's that. <laughs> be good. Um, yeah, it would be. Um, how, have you ever seen, have you ever read any of your books in translation or had a friend do it? Um, well, not me. Unfortunately, I don't have um, skills in other languages. Um, luckily, my agent um, lived a lot of his life, uh, young, younger life in France. His mother oh. was French. And so right off the bat, I, I had an expert um, be able to, to uh, read my French translations and, and tell me they were good. But, but it's, you know, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, it, you know, uh, it, it is very important. I've had experiences where I could just tell by my interactions with my translator that I didn't, I didn't have high hopes for the translation. And, and then I'd ask for a change and I would see sales go up. So I think, um, you know, it uh, not only underlined how important a good translation is, but it also kind of underlined that you kind of, it's, it's hard to watch over it because you don't know the other language, but you got to watch over it if you want to build, um, you know, an audience in another country. Mm -hmm. so. um, when you both are not writing or not on the set, what do you do? Do you have hobbies? Do you have fun? Um, what's your, what do you do? No fun. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I do. Uh, um, I, I started rock climbing when I was 50 years old. Um, and I, uh, I was when I was young, I, 
I thought I was going to be a professional soccer player. That was so my my, my dream. But I I injured my uh, I broke the ligaments in both knees when I was 19. So I had to come up with a plan B um, and do the next best thing, which which was becoming a writer, I guess. Um, but uh, I, I I started rock climbing when I was 50, and I'm I'm not a very talented rock climber, but I totally fell in love with it. So uh, now I. I spend, uh, according to my daughter, too much time rock climbing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's better than golf, I guess. I think golf is safer, but <laughs> Michael, do you rock climb? <laughs> no, and I'm also not a, a rock star. I mean, he left out that he plays in a band. That that would be a pretty cool thing to do when you're not yeah. rock. Um, and, he, and he denigrated the one thing I do. I play golf. <laughs> I, 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 did, I, I actually I did play golf I, I, I said that because golf takes too much time uh, I broke my I broke my um, my four iron against a tree and then I quit golf ah, I, I, I feel like doing that a lot I'm not a very good golfer but the thing is um, if I'm not writing I, I'm trying to find something that really takes me away from writing you know, and I grew up in Florida and I fished and all that stuff. But when you're fishing, you're thinking about what you're writing. So, so to me, fishing is writing. Golf, you have to like blank your mind out. And even though you're driving around, it takes three or four hours and you're really only swinging for maybe 15 minutes total. It does. You, you, there's so many things you got to worry about and try to get right that I find that golf blanks blanks the writing out and if so if i'm looking to blank the writing out for a few hours i'll i'll go do that but the truth is i do love to write so i'm not doing that very much we've gotten more than 50 questions for both of you and while i have more questions of course i overplan. i want to hear from the from the readers um zara asked for joe the opening of the kingdom is a perfect setup for the brothers did you have this in your head when you started thinking about the story or did the opening come later? Uh, the opening came, uh, came later. Uh, the opening is, uh, again, this is not a spoiler. Uh, it's uh, the two brothers, Roy being the older brother who is sort of a uh, more introvert person and Carl being um, a more gentle person. Um, he has gone hunting uh, with a dog to, uh, to impress and to please his father, who thinks he's a sissy. And um, then he has an accident and he shoots the dog. And he goes to his, 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 his older brother for help. And so they have to, um, uh, to, to, uh, to end the suffering of the dog. And then they go back to the, to the father. And um, then... Uh, uh, Roy will tell his father that Carl did clean up himself, that he actually killed the dog. But Carl, of course, being the softer brother, he didn't kill the dog. But this is, um, this is sort of a theme that runs through the book, uh, murder and loyalty. Mm -hmm. We've gotten a couple of questions about the pandemic. And I also had one is um, aside from book, book tours like this, because we can all be in the same room together, but apart, how has the uh, pandemic affected what you write or your writing process? And Michael, you have hints of this coming pandemic in the law of innocence. So Michael, why don't you take that? Well, I mean, you know, my books are set in the year they are published. So um, they have to reflect things that are going on in the world. Um, I actually, was writing this book, set in, it had been set in April, basically, the, the legal stuff in this book was set in April. And as I'm writing it, the pandemic occurs and the courthouses in LA County, or actually in all California were closed down in April. So I was now writing a book that wasn't, you know, realistic, wasn't accurate. So I had to, I stopped writing for a couple of weeks to try to think about what to do. So I, I backed it up and set it basically January, February. And that allowed me to drop in the initial hints of this coming pandemic. And I think that worked well with he, Mickey's facing a trial basically for his life. And so this sense of the world closing in, we're, we're heading towards something bad, I think, you know, kind of twins with 
the concern about where Mickey was going um, with this case and his life and so forth. So it was reflective of what was going on, but at the same time, it worked, I think, in the plotting of the book. Joe, anything about the pandemic into your books or how you write or? Um, no, I saw, uh, I saw that Michael, he, he referred uh, both to the president and the, and the uh, COVID-19 in uh, his book. I'm, I try to, when I write, it's, um, it's set in a um, semi-realistic setting uh, most of the time, at least for the Harry Hole uh, series. It's, uh, it is the real Oslo. Uh, 90%, but it's sort of a slightly twisted. It's like a sort of a Gotham City version of uh, Oslo. Um, in the in the kingdom, it's um, it's uh, slightly more realistic, but it's uh, the place is not named, so it could be any small town in uh, uh, in Norway. Um, it's set in present time but it doesn't really refer to any specific events that uh, gives you any idea of which year it is yeah um question for it's for joe but really it's for both of you and both of you have not there are surprising deaths in both of your novels all your novels actually are you ever surprised when a character meets a fate maybe that you had not planned in the beginning, without giving any way, any secrets away. Um, I go. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. I don't subscribe to that thing about characters surprising you, and you know, I don't outline my books, so a lot of stuff happens in my books that I didn't expect to happen on day one of the writing process. But but that's that's expected to come. Um, you know, so to me, it's the writers in control of everything. So nothing really surprises me, um, you know. And so I, I think I've only done that a couple of times where I've had like what I think would be a, a shocking moment. But, it, uh, you know, the biggest one, I, I don't want to talk about it, but the biggest one I ever did was well planned and it had a reason behind it. Um, I think it allowed me to continue the Harry Bosch series. Uh, and, and draw the center of the series into a different direction. So uh, it's not done lightly, I don't, you know, it's not done for the sheer shock value. Um, yeah. uh, it, it's done with a plan in mind. Joe, what about you? Yeah, well, um, I think that was um, in, in one of my novels, um, The Red Breast, I had, uh, I had like a very traditional buildup of, of characters. And uh, so I, I, I knew that subconsciously uh, the readers was pretty sure that one of the central characters there would be there for, for uh, the ending. Uh, but then uh, um, it, I, I know it was for a, a big surprise that, uh, that this character was, was killed in the, after, at the end of act one in uh, in the in in that book and and it was i mean that is playing with the genre um using expectations as part of uh, the storytelling um but um, um so that was a surprise for the reader it, it, it was not a surprise for me i mean i i all my novels i, I plan them very much in detail so I like the feeling that when I start writing a novel, I mean, when I've done all the preparation and I start writing chapter one, uh, I like to have the feeling that I can tell my readers to, you know, come closer and sit down and, and, and listen because I have this great story to tell you. And I'm not, it's not like I'm creating this story, I'm retelling the story. The story is already there. I want to thank everyone who's sending questions in. I know I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, but keep them coming. Um, Scott wants to know about the process of writing from both of you. Not so much where your ideas come from, but more like, do you have a daily schedule? Do you outline? How many drafts do you go through? And your relationship with your editor. So either one of you want to start with that one? I bet you we do it the same way. Um, I, I'm a, a morning person. I try to get up really early and then I just write till I um, feel like I, I've moved the story a step forward. And 
you know, that's very uh, general. I mean, a story, moving a step forward it could be a whole chapter. It could be a, a good interaction between characters. Uh, it could be the, the laying down of a hidden clue. Um, I just have to feel good about the day and then I can move on to like maybe working on the boss show or something else. But, but the, I keep the, I reserve the morning uh, just for uh, book writing. Yes, well, I I, um, I started doing that uh, after having written a couple of novels at night. I started uh, writing in the morning too. So, uh, but uh, apart from that, I I don't really have a routine. I, uh, I, I it it is still writing is still something I do when I have when I have nothing else to do. <laughs> We're glad you don't have a lot of things other to do. <laughs> um, Hugo from Norway has a question for both of you. Why is Harry such a great name for a police protagonist? I love that question. I think it's cool. Uh, it, it simply is. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I can't answer it, but uh, most people think like I'm influenced by uh, Dirty Harry. Hmm. But a movie that I loved um, uh, was called The Conversation and, and the... Uh, oh, yeah. And the oh, yeah. oh. Protagonist, protagonist Gene Gene Hackman was named Harry Call. Yeah. Um, and there was all this symbolism about him, like you know, he wore a kind of translucent raincoat, and uh, there was all these aspects that went with his name, his last name more than his first name. But that yeah. always stuck with me, and I and I just like that name, Harry. Yeah. Yeah. You can read a whole lot about the name. Um... Harry called on uh, on on the internet. It's um, a, a lot of theories about that name, and uh, I totally agree. It's also one of my favorite movies. Um, uh, by the way, I can I can really recommend uh, um, his um, uh, Coppola's editor um, Matthew Merck um, is uh, interviewed in a book called The Conversations, um, and it's a great uh, great book, um, and. Um, uh, Michael Ondaatje, the the Canadian uh, writer, is, uh, is is the writer of that book. Um, if you love movies, you definitely should uh, should read that book. Um, I've forgotten the question. Why is Harry such a great name? Oh uh, no, yeah, like I said, it's just a great name. <laughs> it in my case, I named him after a um, after my my uh, a local soccer player in uh, in in Moldova was sort of my, my childhood hero. Uh, Barbara, and also this is one of my questions, who do you read besides each other? And what other books besides your own and each other's do you recommend for readers? Well, since uh, Yo mentioned a Hollywood book, I, a Hollywood book I read this year uh, called The uh, Big Goodbye. And it was about, um, well, the shorthand, and it was about the making of a movie called Chinatown, which is probably my favorite film. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's really about that time, the early '70s, the creativity of different people, and and how they came together to make that um, American classic. And it was a pretty fascinating yeah, I, book. Yeah, Michael, can, can can I just ask because I was thinking about Chinatown when I was reading The Law of Innocence. Do you think you were? Uh, uh, could it be that? You were reading that book and that you were subconsciously inspired by that wow that's weird i did read that book while i was writing it and oh. um, i mean i think subconsciously chinatown has influenced a lot of a lot of my uh books but i mean you know the idea of that i mean as is espoused by the character jake in the movie you try you think you're doing something good and you're really doing and you end up hurting people um you know that that is uh a powerful thing and um and i think you see that some in my books but yeah i mean i definitely read that book while i was writing um uh the law of innocence anyway we should ask you um Aline, to recommend books you're you're the one who has your pulse on all this stuff i mean i i have to admit i'm a very slow reader um and i can be writing when most people are reading. So my consumption of books is uh, is, is not that uh, extensive in like the last couple of years. Um, I, I did read um, Blacktop Wasteland, which I think is a fantastic book and 
that's that's a fairly new book, S.A. Crosby. That yes, that was that's actually one of my favorites of this year, Blacktop Wasteland. Um, and I will have my best of the year published in the Sun Sentinel, December uh, 13th, and it will also I'll post it on Facebook. Um, but there's so many. This has been a phenomenal year, I think, for books because there's been so many good ones out. And I think reading is is bringing us more together than ever because for many people that's their main entertainment right now. Uh, Rachel Haswell uh, Hall has a terrific book. Uh, Sarah Stewart Taylor, The Mountains Wild. Um, Ivy Pakoda. Um, these women. It's just a really terrific year for mysteries, and of course, both of yours, which go go without mentioning. Um, we have time for I think one more question, and, and it's. Ever, other readers have mentioned this, it's one of mine. Writers are always planning ahead. So, okay, this book is just out, your book's just out. What's next for both of you? Well, uh, right now I'm, uh, I'm working on, a, um, on a two collections of short stories, one with uh, uh, crime stories and another one with um, with uh, science fiction stories. They will both be published next year here in uh, Norway. Are you also doing something on rock climbing? Yeah, I'm actually writing about um, um, myself. Try, I've, I've set a goal for myself, a route I'm going to climb. And uh, so I'm uh, writing about that process, being an old man trying to... to get, <laughs> you know sort of turn back the clock uh but also writing about uh, the american climber lynn hill uh she climbed the the nose one of the oh, yeah. Yeah. Famous routes in the world um she was the first person to do that and also a norwegian climber hans christian dorset who um who died in uh, uh triangle uh, in the himalayas in um in the uh, 80s who was a brilliant climber. So I'm, I'm sort of writing about two brilliant climbers and then a very, very mediocre climber in the middle, which is me. So your Harry won't be coming back for at least a year. That's right. Okay. Michael, what are, are you going to be writing a book about golf or rock climbing? I was about to say, I guess I have to write about golf. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, one of the things I love in the Bosch show when there's a scene at a golfing range and... Uh, uh, Jerry Edgar says uh, to Bosch, you should p take up golf. And he goes, anything that uh, where you can drink and smoke while you're doing it is not a sport. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to go back to Harry and but more more about Renee. I'm going to do a Renee Ballard book. Uh, I'm going to start writing that in about a month for next year. And Harry, Harry will be in it. So it won't, I won't go too long without uh, Harry uh, showing up. Yeah, so I think wait, one more thing before we call is several people have mentioned what strong women you all write about. And I, I agree with this. I mean, Joe and Michael, you both have had very strong women. I love Renee. I love when you write female characters. Do you have any secrets for that? Just in, be inspired by um, strong women. I mean, Renee Boward is based on a real detective who I'm lucky enough to spend some time with and research with. And uh, so uh, if she comes off as being strong, it's, it just means that I've done a good job of capturing the real person and putting her through the, you know, the lens of fiction. Joe? Yeah. No, uh, 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 as, um, same thing, you know, it's, uh, um, in, you look around and you see strong characters. Uh, if it's, um, you know, I've, I don't feel any pressure to like put in strong female characters. I know that when you're writing for 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 the movies or the TV series today, that is one of the first things they ask about. Uh, does it have strong female characters? And I think it's it's should be only natural to put in strong female characters. Um, if it, if it feels forced, it it won't work. But hopefully, there are enough inspiration for strong female characters around to 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 put it in in a um, in a uh, organic way. I agree. And that was really our last question. I'm going to turn this back over to politics and prose, where I really appreciate doing this. Um, Michael, Joe, this has been a lot of fun. And I think it's we've had a lot of readers, more than 50 uh, up. Now it's over 60 questions. Sorry. Couldn't get to everyone. And we had more than 500 people here today. Love the books. 
best of luck. I'm looking forward to both of your next next book. So I'm calling it turn turning it over to politics and prose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arlene. On behalf of Politics and Prose, I'd like to thank you, Arlene, you, Joe, and you, Michael, for this very wonderful event. Before we do go, um, I do have the last question. Uh, this is something we always ask of our authors. Um, so for both Michael and Joe, um, we want to just ask, is there anything you're currently reading? And if so, uh, could you please share that with our viewing audience? Yes, let me see. No, I don't have the book here. I'm, uh, uh, I'm writing, uh, I'm reading a book on uh, called uh, Go All the Way, where, which is a raspberry song. Uh, it's about the uh, power pop of uh, the late 60s and 70s and 80s. I'm, uh, I mentioned the Black Hat um, Wasteland. I think that was, I think that's the kind of the book of the year in America. Um, S.A. Cosby, a great new voice. And it's a story that just keeps moving. Um, but at the same time, it's a really strong so reflection of a lot of the issues that we're facing in, um, in the USA and, and around the world. And then meantime, I'm halfway through this book. Some people may have heard of it. Of that guy? <laughs> I, I mark my spot with a mask. I don't know what that says about society. <laughs> <laughs> but, but really good book. And often Can I add what I'm reading? Absolutely. It's, um, They're Gone by E.A. Bears, B-A-R-R-E-S. He actually lives in the Washington, D.C. area, and the book is called They're Gone, and it just came out the same day as your two books came out. So I'm recommending that. And I will recommend that in print. <laughs> cool. Excellent. Thank you very much. And again, thank you everyone who's tuned in for this PMP Live. And we hope to see, so to speak, you all at a future event. Um, everyone stay 